A much overdue and long anticipated series on how to build a single ended amplifier is the project at hand today. So I'm very excited about this one. I've been contemplating it for a while, put a lot of thought into it, and uh, pretty excited about what we're going to be doing here today. So uh, let's, let's dive on in. Okay, before we dive in, I found this quote the other day, and it uh, it actually did inspire me. It says, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires from William Arthur Ward. And, um, you know, it was kind of an epiphany for me because, I, you know, I've often wondered why do I make these videos so long and why do I go in so much depth and sometimes I just ramble on, etc. And then I realized, oh, yeah, I used to be a teacher for a living. Um, it's something I did in the early 90s. Um, I'd probably still be doing it today. It would be my career path of choice. Other than the, uh, the money I was making in IT, uh, moving up the ranks in leadership there within corporate America um, was tough to leave and go teach. So kind of my thought all along was, you know, when I retire one day, um, I'll just find a job, you know, teaching electronics or something at a community college, and that would be my retirement gig, and it very well still may be. But um I thought this, uh, you know, so I'm not saying I'm a great teacher right now. I'm just trying to be this superior teacher. So I'm trying to uh, not only explain to you what we're going to do here, but I'm also going to try to demonstrate it. And uh, maybe if it inspires a few of you, it'll uh, instill some greatness in me. I don't know. Hang tight. We're going to have it. This is going to be a long series, probably six, eight, ten videos. I'm not sure. Um, break them up into pieces and we'll kind of go through it step by step and uh, see where this thing ends up. All right, before we get started, I have this burning desire inside of me right now to talk about subjectivity. Um, the definition of the word subjective is that something is based on or influenced by a person's feelings, taste, or opinions. And I can tell you in this series of tube amplifier design, architecture, build, etc., that we're about to go through, almost everything I will talk about while it may on the surface appear to be a fact, because Mark said it and he, he said it pretty emphatically, um, the reality is almost everything related to this is subjective. Now don't get me wrong, there is a lot of math, physics, um, calculus, etc. that goes in behind tube amplifier design. Probably not going to go to the deep, deep weeds of that in this series. Um, but as a lot of the topics we'll talk about, you know, people will say, I'll say, you know, hey, I think orange is the best color for this amplifier chassis. And somebody else will say, no, 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 blue is the best color for that amplifier chassis. And if you get into it, you know, I'll say, well, well orange is the best because it'll grab your attention. And, you know, it's bright and, and wow, it'll just be a great looking amplifier on your sitting on your desk or whatever and somebody else will say well no I really want the amplifier chassis to kind of blend in and um, you know I just want to be able to see the tubes glow so don't, don't make my chassis bright well that same kind of debate goes on with should I pick this type of tube or that type of tube should I pick this type of capacitor or that type of capacitor should I pick this type of rectification circuit or that type of rectification circuit etc etc th this whole subject I'm about to do a series on um, every aspect of it is pretty much debatable other than some of the basics like Ohm's law Kirchhoff's law things of that nature um, you know when it comes to building and actually picking components and choosing a schematic or a design all that stuff gets very subjective so just take that take everything with a grain of salt you know I may say I like this and you may say you like that well that's just the way life is and uh, it's the way this video series is gonna go Okay, hang with me for a few minutes here on this slide. I think it's a very important one. This is our amplifier build approach. And this is this is something I laid out. Uh, it's kind of my approach. There again, might be subjective. Somebody else may say, hey, let's take a different route to this. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that here more in a minute. But first off, you've got to kind of lay out the overall architecture of your amplifier. Just like when you're building a house, you know, do you want a ranch style house? Do you want a you know, kind of a split level? Do you want, um, you know, something um, kind of mid-century looking? You know, there's a lot of a lot of different architectures around a house style. 
And the same thing kind of happens with an amplifier. you got to figure out what you want at the end of the day here with your actual amplifier. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we get into that. Um, up next, you, you know, we're going to pick the type of tube we want to use for this amplifier. So uh, if you think about the architecture kind of defining, you know, what the house looks like, when you start to get into tube type, give you an analogy that's kind of like saying hey do we want a brick house or do we want maybe a uh, a cedar shake siding house you know something of that nature we're actually going to pick the tube that we're going to use to build this thing with then we've got to actually get into and do the design and or the schematic and so for this video series I what I'm not doing is I'm not starting from scratch with a piece of paper and designing uh, basically doing circuit analysis and design of a tube amplifier. That is a um, very complicated subject that honestly most of my viewers would need um, a couple years of electrical engineering and some pretty deep math to get into. Um, the beauty of it is um, we don't really need to go there and let me tell you why. First there are so many designs that are out there today and if you look at the basics of all of them, they all kind of hover around um, some very simple fundamentals and then they get tweaked a little bit along the way and then every once in a while you'll see a new amplifier design pop up and you, but you start to look at it and you're like, well, that's pretty much the same as that other amplifier design I saw in a 1954, you know, RCA Radiotron design manual. But they tweak this thing over here, and maybe they're using a newer component, you know, maybe some LEDs for biasing or something over here. But the fundamentals are kind of the same, so no use in reinventing the wheel when it comes to that. A lot of good schematics out there. We're going to pick one we kind of like, and then we're going to take that, and we're going to build it, and then we're going to tweak it and see if we can make it better or improve it in some way or make it sound the way we want it to sound. Um, versus just kind of starting from scratch. So just just a word to the wise there. You don't necessarily to build to be a good amplifier builder. Um, matter of fact, about half the amplifiers I see built out there today, um, they're all based around some pretty basic designs. Um, so um, you know, I hope that's okay with you. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Okay, once we get our design kind of down that we're going to go with, then what we got to do is um, spend a good bit of time putting together a component list, otherwise known as a build of materials. Um, you know, basically, w w what specific components? This is kind of in your in your the house analogy. Hey, are we going to use copper pipe or are we going to use you know kind of uh, PVC pipe for the plumbing? And uh, and by the way, are we going to use half inch or quarter inch, etc.? And what is the part number we need for this thing? That's what you're doing when you're putting together your component list. Um, after we've got that kind of done, then you can order stuff and it'll show up at your door. That's the beauty of the internet. And then you can uh, get it over here next, on, move on to the test build. We can jump onto the bench and we can start, you know, get us a piece of plywood, lay it down, start strapping these components down. And we can actually build this thing and get first, you know, get it up and running functionally and, um, you know, hear how it sounds. Um, from there, that's when the fun begins. This is what I enjoy doing. I enjoy taking an existing design and then tweaking it and uh, seeing if I can make it better. Uh, see if I can improve on it. Well, what if I change this out? Or what if I, what if I change the way this feedback loop works? Or change the amount of feedback, etc. We can tweak it, modify it to get it to sound the way we want it to. Um, you know, once we get all that locked down, then we've kind of got our final design done. At that point, we can go back and edit our build of materials, um, and then we can come along and lay out this thing physically. The, there's some art that goes into physically laying out a chassis. Uh, or how this thing's going to lay out on a chassis. Um, and then we got to, you know, we actually got to go do something about a chassis, whether we're going to build one from scratch or whether we're going to buy one and just, you know, uh, cut holes in it, etc. We got to figure that out. And then finally, we'll do the final build and put this thing together. Um, we'll do some testing at that point, And then you got to do maybe some more tweaking because what you built laid out on a breadboard set up. And what you put inside of a metal chassis could can be a little different sometimes. Um, you got different factors at play. 
Um, so you do your final tweaks then, and then you kind of wrap this thing up as your finalized build and uh, put any of the, you know, polishing on it you would want, you know, um, cosmetics, etc., to get this thing where you want it. And we'll be done with the build at that point. So um, hold tight. We're gonna. The good news is we're gonna get through about half of this today in this video. <laughs> the bad news is it's gonna take about, you know, half a dozen videos to get through the rest of these. So. Uh, so hang tight with me. One thing I will say, I did say I'd come back around and talk about the subjectivity. I'll give you an example. Some people might would say, you know what, I was at a ham fest recently, or I was over at a buddy's house, and he gave me a beautiful pair of 300B amplifier tubes. Or, hey, I was at this ham fest, and I found a set of, you know, 45s and wow I want to build an amplifier because you know these things are really expensive but I got a really good deal on them based on that I want to build my amplifier based upon the tube type so there we just move that one up the list to move the architecture down because you know we started with some components that we had or hey maybe maybe my uncle passed away and I, we were cleaning out his basement and I found this set of output transformers laying there and they were off an old Heath kit, something or another. But these are a set of push-pull, um, you know, output transformers. So I'd really love to use these things and build an amp to kind of commemorate, you know, my uncle and the stuff he used to do. So all of a sudden, you've gone from way down here to a, an item in your components going up here, which is now driving the tube type that might match with it, which is now driving the architecture and design. So you know you may be starting from scratch you may be starting from some components you have is my point so even my approach here is somewhat subjective okay let's dive on into the architecture first and foremost there's really only two basic architectures in use today in tube amplifiers not that you couldn't find another one there are some out there but I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of about 98 percent of all amplifier designs done in the last few decades have been based around one of two type of um, architectures. And the first one being the single, single ended um, amplifier. And most amplifiers that were built, let's say all the way back to the early 1900s, you know, through the 1920s, 40s, 50s, etc., were of the single ended nature. And they're the most simplistic um, and easiest to understand. They have some pros and cons, and we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, and so that's one type. The other type here is known as the push-pull or class B amplifier, and it's a little more complex, and we'll get into the pros and cons. But let's come back to this single-ended amplifier, and it's called a class A amplifier. Uh, there are about five or more different types of classes of amplifiers. I would say there are about five basic ones, A, B, C, D, um, and or four. And then there, there's some variants of that out there. But um, as it relates to audio amplification, Class A or Class B, or a slight variation of the Class B called Class AB, is pretty much what you see out there. When you get into Class C amplifiers, that's typically used more in an RF application, and when you get into Class D amplifiers, that's used more in a digital application. Um, but this thing's pretty simple. Let me walk you through it here. Um, your signal input comes in over here on the left-hand side. You've usually got some kind of potentiometer here that is a uh, volume control, basically. You're feeding into the grid of the first tube here. Uh, it's a triode in this case. And usually this whole stage right here is kind of the, the first stage of amplification. In other words, the line level signal you're sending in over here from your uh, CD player, iPhone, turntable, etc., is not strong enough to drive the output tube directly. So you amplify it a little bit um, enough to then drive it, send it over here into the output um, tube, which does the majority of the power amplification. So this sometimes is known as um, signal or um, voltage amplification. A lot of times this over here is more of a power uh, amplification stage, um, which then ultimately drives over here into the output transformer. 
um, which ultimately then converts this uh, signal over to the right impedance and drives your speakers. Keep in mind the signal coming off of this tube right here may be anywhere in the 400 to 600 or more volts. You really can't hook that up practically to a set of speaker wires and to a uh, speaker. So not only does this thing convert the impedance, but it also lowers the voltage and increases the current, um, which ultimately drives your 8 ohm speaker here. Um, if you'll notice one little interesting part of this amplifier design, um, it has a tap here which feeds back to the screen of this tube. It's called a screen tap. Um, it's a neat little nuance, not found in all single-ended single designs, but it is in this one. One thing you will find about a single-ended um, design is that what gets fed into the input here, in other words, the waveform fed into the input, um, gets amplified exactly like that on the output, and so this amplifier is doing all the work. It's, it's amplifying the positive aspects of the waveform, it's amplifying the negative aspects of the wa waveform, and uh, ultimately driving the speaker over here. Okay, up next, the push-pull or Class B, sometimes tweaked to be the Class AB. But it's a little more, as you can see, it's a little more complex here. There's more tubes involved. I'm going to walk you through this bottom schematic first. Um, first off, your signal comes in, goes into the grid of your first tube, gets amplified. Well, then it comes over here to another tube, and this tube doesn't typically do any amplification. Um, what it typically does is it takes the signal and it splits it. It takes the positive parts of the signal, it sends them down this path, and it takes the negative parts of the sig signal and sends them down this path um, into the tube over here. And I couldn't find a good picture that showed that relating to a tube amplifier, but I did kind of find one over here relating to a transistor amplifier. But basically an input signal comes in, and it goes into something here that does phase inverting. And that's what this section here of this tube is called, the phase inverter. Um, in this case, with the transistor, they were using a little bit of a, a transformer to cause that effect. But the bottom line is you see coming out of this device here, in this case it's the tube, um, but you're basically taking the signal and you're kind of um, inverting it. At any rate, what comes out of this is the two different halves of the, the tube here are split. Um, I mean, the two different... Um, halves of the signal or split. So you kind of got your negative waveform pieces here and your positive over here and then ultimately they go into the output transformer once they've been amplified and they get stitched back together to form the final output signal. So um, in this case comes in here gets amplified some comes over here the positive peaks get sent to this tube the negative peaks get sent to this tube both halves of those get amplified and they ultimately get stitched back right together here in the output transformer just from the design and configuration of it which ultimately goes over here and drives your speaker at that point point. and um, you may wonder well why would you want to do that and, and um, it really comes down to back in this design this tube is turned on 100 percent of the time and it is amplifying both the positive and negative peaks um, so this thing's in heavy-duty operating mode at this point in time. These over here, this tube is only amplifying the positives, this one's amplifying the negatives, and while this one's busy amplifying the negatives, this one over here is kind of chilling out, um, taking a break per se, and uh, you know maybe relaxing a little bit. So um, these tubes run at what's called a different duty cycle. This thing's running at basically a 100% duty cycle on all the time. These things here are running closer to more like a 50% duty cycle, so uh, longer tube life, etc. Um, let's, let's dive to the next page. Okay, probably the most subjective slide I've ever created in all of my videos. And here we go, because this is, a, this is almost a holy war religious debate out in the uh, community. <laughs> um, so here we go. These are my belief systems. Take them for what they're worth. Um, I believe a single-ended amplifier is a simpler design. There's less components, less tubes, uh, just easier to work with. Um, I believe it creates a more exact representation of the input signal being amplified on the output. Keep in mind, we're not taking two part, we're not taking a signal, splitting it apart, amplifying it, and stitching it back together. Um, 
you know, at, at least on paper, uh, these things um, show up as a uh, more exact representation. I believe they have better detail. Um, yeah, it's just something I've found over time. I think um, kind of the detail to the finer aspects of music uh, get, get portrayed better through a single ended amplifier. And boy, that is a subjective statement. I think they have a more open and airy sound, thus leading them uh, to sound better with certain types of music. And, and hey, not that rock and roll won't sound great on a single ampl amplifier, it can. Just these things lend themselves really well to jazz, anything with horns, classical music, acoustic music, kind of easy listening. Um, if you want some background music playing in your house while you're just doing stuff around, um, single ended amplifier is amazing for that. Um, you know, let's jump over here to the pros of the push-pull. You know, it's a higher power amplifier. These things put out more power. It's hard to build a 100-watt single-ended amplifier or even a 50-watt single-ended amplifier. I'm not, I didn't say it was impossible. I said it is much harder to do. Um, push-pull seem to have a much more authoritative sound, so kind of in-your-face uh, you know, very responsive. They have better bass response at the end of the day. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a belief system that because of the feedback they use in these things that they have a low, lower distortion figures. Um, and then they also, um, because of this, they lend themselves really well because of this authoritative sound, better bass response, lend themselves to rock and roll, metal, hip hop, pop, and just all around general purpose. I have listened to a lot of jazz albums on a push-pull amplifier and they sound amazing. So these are generalities at the end of the day. All right, so the cons of a single-ended amplifier. One, they are a much lower power amplifier. Let me give you an example. You take like a, uh, a Type 45 or a 2A3 tube, you know, even with the best design, pushing these things to their limit, these are like two and a half to three or four watt amplifiers. Um, you know, even a nice, beautiful 300B amplifier, the, the classic Western Electric 300B, that's like an eight watt amplifier um, on a good day. So um, they're really low power. If you want to get into a high powered single ended amplifier, um, even even a massive 211 tube with, um, you know, having to apply thousand volts or more to the plate of that thing, uh, which you know, this thing's huge, mammoth, heavy, big, heavy transformers, probably weighs 50 pounds or more. It still might be a 20 watt amplifier. Um, so lower power amplifier. Um, single ended amplifiers are very susceptible to power supply, noise, hum, etc. They don't have a lot of built in noise rejection. Um, they are less efficient. Um, in other words, Remember I talked earlier about that duty cycle 100% on all the time, which means they produce more heat, uh, or they, you know, consuming more power all the time, which ultimately means they pr produce more heat. I've got a, a, a 300B amplifier I built a long time ago that I've got here. Um, when I put it on the bench and crank that thing up, um, you know, the room gets pretty warm pretty pretty quick. It's, not, it's like a, a nice little uh, thousand watt heater sitting over there in the corner. Um, you know, because they're on all the time, the duty cycle, the shorter tube life associated with that, um, they do require more because of the low power. They require more efficient speakers. If you've got your favorite speakers, which are a set of JBL L100s or something like that, that have a, uh, you know, a sensitivity rating of 87 um, dB, you know, per watt per meter, um, eh. You probably want to get up into the 96 or higher, 92 at least, or 94, 96, 9800 dB um, rated speakers uh, for a tube for a uh, single ended amplifier. Um, you know, something there's this there's this phenomenon called the dampening factor, and the dampening factor is really kind of a a ratio of the output impedance of your amplifier stage to the to the actual load, the impedance of the load you're working with. And single-ended amplifiers typically have a lower dampening factor and in, in, in a, a number that gets affined to it. And because of that, they have poor bass response. In other words, they don't necessarily 
control the woofer very well. In other words, you can get some sloppy bass out of a single-ended amplifier. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do around the power supply, different things to try to co compensate for that, but end of the day, single-ended amplifiers are known for having less bass response than a uh, push-pull amplifier. They, um, you know, the designs and components within a single-ended amplifier can create a signature sound more so. So in other words, if you like to tube roll, if you like to roll capacitors, swap, hey, I'm running some orange drops today, but I want to swap those out with some old Russian paper and oils, but I want to try some, uh, maybe some real high-end Jansons or something or um, whatever, um, changing out components will define the sound of one of these uh, single-ended amplifier more so than a push-pull amplifier. And because of that, people sometimes people think see that as a bad thing. Some people like myself see that as a good thing. I can actually tweak this thing to sound how I like my music to sound. Last con, heavy, big components. Um, it's more difficult to build a strong power supply for a single ended amplifier. You end up with big, heavy transformers and chokes, etc. It's just a, uh, you know, it's a, um, it's a bigger amplifier at the end of the day. You come over here on the cons of the push pull. We saw it already. It's a more complex design. You know, there may be less of this signature sound. In other words, some people might would say, hey, you know, all push pull amplifiers just about sound the same. It's not a true statement, but they sound more the same than if you had three different single ended amps. You might be able to tell a big difference in the sound between each of those. Um, you know, one con, I, some people call it a, a con, some people see it as a, a, a pro, um, but push pull amplifiers a lot of times use feedback. In other words, they take a little sampling of the signal from the output, they send it back to the input. And in doing so, they kind of course correct the amplifier overall and uh, bring it better distortion numbers. But at the end of the day, hey, are you repeat? You know, you're kind of mucking with the signal a little bit. Some people might would say um, they have low, you know, less low level and detail and dynamics. I, I have heard things on a single in that amplifier that I swear I've never heard when playing the same record through a push pull amplifier. The, the most minute little details. Um, but that's that's just something that uh, I believe they're again a very very subjective statement. And then finally, um, when you're stitching those um, signals back together in the output, there can be this thing here called crossover distortion. In other words, those things don't stitch back together perfectly. Some people say it's a bad thing. Some people say you never hear it. So uh, it's another subjective statement, but it but it does exist. Um, if that makes sense. Alright, at the end of the day, there are upteen number of articles, probably videos, um, discussion forum topics, books, written on the pros and cons of single-ended versus push-pull amplifiers, and yeah, this video could go on for days. I, I could probably do a whole series just on this, but um, you just had to take what I put here as, as my belief system. It's all subjective, and we're going to roll on and make our choice here. So what I've done is uh, single-ended here we come. Uh, why we selected a single-ended design for our build? And this is why. First off, I like to tweak and define signature sound. So after you've built a few amps in your life, you kind of get beyond building one and making it work. And you kind of get into, I want to build one and make it sound just the way I want to make it sound. And I think that's what single-ended amplifiers excel at. So uh, that's, that's one reason. Second, um, I have a lot of very efficient speakers around here, so I'm not worried about that. Um, uh, Nick, I like to listen to a lot of jazz, acoustic rock, indie. You know, um, acoustic rock is probably one of my favorite um, genres of music, if that is one. Uh, along with, I love a lot of indie stuff, and, and there's a lot of indie stuff that's acoustic. And at the end of the day, I love jazz, any jazz that has horns in it. Um, Oliver Nielsen's by far my favorite jazz, uh, both artist and composer, and um, you know, it's just really good stuff, and it sounds really great on a single-ended amplifier. Um, and the fourth and probably most important reason for why we chose a single-ended amplifier for this build 
it is easier to make this video teaching the basics with single-ended amplifier. In other words, once you get good at uh, single-ended and you understand that, then, you know, push-pull is kind of layering on to that. Uh, you know, uh, the next step is the way, uh, the next iteration of complexity is kind of the way I view it. All right, as we look at common tube types for single-ended amplifiers, um, first off, they're typically triodes, a three-element tube. They lend themselves very well to sounding great in a single-ended setup. And it's kind of his, how it was historically done. If you go back to a, you know, a 1920s Western electric amplifier, RCA amplifier or something, um, they're typically you know, designed around a single-ended amplifier because that was the only design that existed at that time. And the types of tubes that were being used were things like 45s and 2A3s back then and 211s, etc. So, um, hey, they sound great. I'll tell you, the, uh, the old 45s and 2A3s, really hard to build. Matter of fact, right now on my listening station over here, I have a Type 45 single-ended amplifier that I built set up um, that I'm listening to. And the downside to that amplifier puts out about two and a half watts per channel. There's not a lot of power out. Same thing, same thing with this 2A3. Even the 300B, the classic Western Electric 300B, that kind of redefined hi-fi audio back in the day. It's an eight watt tube, uh, you know, on a good day. Um, you know, EL84s are commonly used. You see a lot of uh, single-ended amplifiers. A lot of your old um, console units that you used to buy that would have your built-in turntable, your radio, all built into a nice uh, you know, shelf unit. You open the lid on it, um, etc. If you get down underneath there, you'll find a single-ended amplifier, EL84, a lot of times. Um, sometimes you see EL34s, um, not as common, but every once in a while. You're starting to see more and more uh, single-ended KT88s. This guy named Michael Abdella um, came up with a unique, not not that unique, a, a twist of an existing design that uh, really worked out well with a KT88 here recently in the last, uh, I'd say, 10 years. And you've just seen a lot of people building amplifiers based upon that design. Um, the 807, that's a classic um, old military ruggedized tube. It got used in a lot of what I would consider um, AF modulation. In other words, the way, if you went to a radio station today, the way that they, um, they get the microphone on to and out through the antenna, through the air, so your FM receiver can pick that up, is they have an audio amplifier stage that puts audio signal onto the RF carrier, which ultimately gets amplified and sent out. And that process is called modulation. And you saw 807 amp, um, tubes used a lot for modulator or drivers um, back in the day. And then you had like kind of the classic 211, 845. These are big tubes. They're starting, I mean, you can get towards, you know, a 20 watt amplifier with one of these. There's some downsides. Um, you start feeding these things with 700, 800, 900, 1000, 1100 volts. Um, and dealing with that level of voltage requires some special skills, some special components. It's not for everybody. Um, so you don't see those all that often, but when you do, they're really nice, uh, usually expensive high-end amplifiers. Um, so we kind of you know, ground around which of these do we want to go with, and ultimately we went with the 807. Here we come. Um, couple reasons I went with the 807. Um, first and foremost, um, I happen to have a bunch of them, a new old stock ones laying around. So that's always a good thing. And um, second off, you know, the um, there's been a lot of posts recently on one of the forums I hang out uh, around this design this guy over in the Netherlands uh, made. And it seems to be a pretty solid amplifier. And I've, I've been wanting to try it. So um, you know, I, I've built a lot of amplifiers over time, and some, sometimes you just want to do something you haven't done before. So um, that, that brings us here. The third reason, um, my very first amplifier way, way back in probably the, uh, I don't know, early 80s um, was a 807 amplifier. It was an RF amplifier, not an AF audio frequency. It was RF, radio frequency amplifier, and it used four 807s in it. And I have wasted a ridiculous amount of time trying to find a picture that I know I have of that thing. Somewhere in my house, there is a little plastic container with um, 
pictures from uh, way back when I was in probably junior high school when I got this thing. Um, and I know I have a picture of it. So when I find it somewhere in this series, I'm going to show it. But but it kind of inspired me to say, hey, let's let's go down this 807 path. We've got we've got some uh, some nostalgic love for it. There's a lot of uh, conversations going on on the forums out there right now about this. And um, and I've got a bunch of tubes. So ultimately that uh, it drove me down this path. And we're going to go the uh, or, uh, the uh, 807 path. In the spirit of not trying to eat an entire elephant in one chunk, I'm going to break this thing up a little bit and stop here with this video today. Um, I originally planned to go all the way down through the components in um, video one, but I have decided today to kind of stop at the uh, after the tube type, and I'm going to break up design and um, components into video number two. Should put this thing at about a 35 minute video, which is uh, getting getting to be about the end of the length I'd like to see these things but tell me what you think so far um, or are, are you excited um, what not and uh, we'll keep we'll keep cranking these things out hopefully I'll make part two today as well thanks everybody